Welcome to the Black Tower Podcast, a Wheel of Time podcast. I'm Greg. And I'm Thorne. And today, we're going to talk about Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time. So, uh, to continue what we were talking about last week, we had started our book review of The Shadow Rising. I am not even going to pretend that this is not my favorite book in the entire series, but it definitely is, and I am excited to get to the second part of this um, review. But before we do that, uh, Thorne, why don't you uh, lay down the spoiler warning for us? This episode will contain spoilers for The Wheel of Time up to and including The Shadow Rising. If you have not finished reading The Shadow Rising, then stop listening now or you will be in danger of being spoiled. You have been thusly warned. So, <laughs> where we left off last week, we had thoroughly discussed, at least as far as I can remember, we had discussed the plot line concerning Rand and Matt and all those that went to the IO Waste, everything that kind of surrounded his um, eventual recognition as the... Um, Chief of Chiefs, the Karakarn of the Aiel, you know, with his trip into Rudion um, and all of that, everything with Kuladin, we talked about that. So we have three other plot lines going on in this book, all of which are pretty important. And we just kind of want to interact with those tonight as a way of wrapping up the, um, the second half of this review. So... Thorne, let's visit the two rivers. What do we have going on in the two rivers in this book? So, uh, Perrin makes it to the two rivers, and he discovers that people are caught between Trollocs that are led by a man named Slayer and uh, the Children of the Light. He also finds uh, the Aes Sedai Baron and Alana uh, searching for potential pupils. So, they're they're searching for women who can channel, which so, so there's Perrin, a lot. <laughs> you're right. So Perrin shows up and he's got, if I remember correctly, he's got Fayil with him. He's got Loyal. I'm trying to remember if he brought he's anyone else. Gaul, Chiad, and Bane. Mm-hmm, that's right. Yep. And he's got he's got three Aiel and an Ogier and a Saldean. Just the Saldean would have been enough to raise eyebrows, but he's got an Ogier and three Aiel returning to the two rivers who only have heard of most or all of those people, probably in stories. I mean, I can't imagine many two rivers folk have met many Saldeans, except if maybe you were in some of the larger, you know, areas in and near the two rivers where there may have been a little bit more trading. But the Saldeans left so far to the north. I don't think there's a lot of interaction between them and anyone from the two rivers. But Perrin I strikes. Think it's kind of Go ahead. Important to mention, it's not mentioned here in our notes, but Perrin and Fael are kind of arguing at this point. Oh yeah, <laughs> which you have to ask at a certain point. When are they not? I mean, it happened yes. for a while. Uh, <laughs> Perrin, I I can't remember exactly what happened, but they're in a disagreement. It's kind of ridiculous. Neither wants to admit the other one's right. Um, <laughs> and so Perrin, Gaul, Perrin and Gaul are following Fael, Bane, Chiad, and uh, Loyal. Because before Perrin got the chance to ask Loyal to help him go through the ways, Fael got to him first. So, and, and I think what I think what Fael wants is for Perrin to uh, ask to join them. So <clears throat> every now and again, I get on the wheel of the main wheel of time group. I say it's the main wheel of time group on Facebook. I mean, it's just called the wheel of time. I see a lot of Fael hate in there. I mean, it's I it reaches almost well, it reaches almost Gawain levels. You know, I mean, it's just like yeah, every other person. No, absolutely. They, they post memes in there, like hating on Fael. And, and here's my thing. To me, does Fael get a little, mm, I don't want to say annoying, but is she a little much at times? Yes. But I think overall as a character, I thoroughly enjoyed Fael, especially in this book. I, I liked her whole character. Now, there's some, there's some things I would comment on that happened later in the series that we won't talk about tonight because it's not relevant. But as far as The Shadow Rising goes, I mean, I can see where people may get a little annoyed, but 
I, I guess my viewpoint is she's if you're going to get annoyed, do it. She's just doing her angsty teen thing. Well, yeah, and, and and the thing is too is Perrin's in a weird place as well. I mean, he's just went through all this stuff over the past two books, and now he's coming back home and to see that all this stuff is happening at home. I mean, he was wanting to go back home because the whole time, if if you'll recall, the whole time. You know, in Eye of the World and The Great Hunt especially, there's a lot of times where, you know, parents have this inner monologue of, I just want to go back to the Two Rivers. I just want to go back to being a blacksmith's apprentice. I don't, I don't like Which it. Which, at this point, he already was in love with Fael. I think what it was is he didn't want to get Fael roped into everything. He was trying to protect her. But Fael is stubborn. And she don't take shit from nobody. Well, is that a thing she, of the hero saying, you know what, let me shoulder this. I don't want to bring anyone else into my woes. And then someone else coming in and saying, no, let me share this with you. That's because Fayul was kind of, I think Fayul was kind of perceiving it as a slight, like, I don't find you worthy enough to, to share in this. Whereas Perrin was like, well, no, I'm just trying to keep you out of this mess. I want to protect you, you know, because you're, because yes. I love you. And she's like, well, you love me, but as you can see, I can take care of myself and you need my help is basically where Fayu was coming from. Yeah, Saldanes have a very viewpoint of their women are very strong. Oh, yeah. They are very strong in physically and they are very strong willed. So you've Fayil's got mother. these women. Yes, she is. Oh, my God. <laughs> Talk about an unstoppable force. Um but you've got these women who grow up and they're taught that they're taught to use knives and they're taught that they're to help defend their husbands and they're help. They, they're t- the second uh, wave to defend against the blight. She, she grew up where she could be attacked by a Trolloc at any mm-hmm. time. And her father was one of the great captains. So he was up there doing stuff all the time so she learned from a very young age to fight and being treated like a woman that needed to be protected kind of did feel like a slight to her because she's a strong woman she learned to fight she knows how to fight and that's one thing i always liked about anyone from any part of the borderlands whether it be saldea or any of the other nations you know, there's a there's a few. Yeah. I, I can't think of them all right now, but but definitely Saldea. There is Saldea, uh, Arafel. Mm-hmm. I think Eridomon. Eridomon no, was kind of Eridomon wasn't quite a. It, it was more kind of on the near the coast. It was at the north of Ameth Plain, but it wasn't like oh. an actual true borderland. I remember them all. It's uh, Saldea, Shinar. Candor and Arafel. Candor, that's the one I was thinking of that I couldn't remember. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard it here today. Thorne's not that great at spoiler warnings, but she can tell you about geography in the Wheel of Time. So, skill. Yeah, I can tell you about geography. I have no notes on this. (laughs) She's just like, hold on, I got this. I have got this, y'all. I don't even need this stuff on the screen because the map's in my head. Check this. If you ask me about anything other than the Borderlands, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think I know some things. I hope I do because I'm on a podcast where I have to talk about it. Now, uh, but one thing I always liked about the, the Borderlanders is that resiliency, is that every single person from the time they can hold a blade to to forever, you've got to be willing and ready to fight at, a, at, a, at the drop of a hat, at a moment's notice, so everyone's got to be trained. And, you know, we encounter this. The very first time we really encounter this is toward the end of Eye of the World when they when the party ends up in Shinar and they meet the Shinarans and their you know, way of living, which each one of the Borderlands, you know, they have their own culture, which I always thought was cool. But the shared uh, connection between all of them is this we stand we all stand guard against the blight. And even though we have differences with our neighbor, we are bound together by this solemn duty to stand against the darkness yes that will come out of the blight and will overtake us. And if they overtake us, well, guess what? They're going to go into the South and we don't need them to do that. We are basically defending all these other nations. So 
if all the Borderlanders are super chill with each other, they don't fight each other. And if somebody from the South comes and attacks the Borderlands, they'll all band together and be like, hey, you need to fuck right off. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, they they, they kind of had this unofficial, official, unofficial, I don't know, uh, <laughs> like alliance, basically, where it's like this understanding of, look, don't start nothing. And we're not going to start enough with them with you. And we're going to be here to help you because we have an enemy beyond our borders to the north. We don't need to be messing but with each other why, or the south. That's why uh, people like Lan, who isn't any part of a single borderland nation because uh, Malkir has gone. Mm-hmm. He can travel through them and be accepted. Right. Because he's still a borderlander. And especially yeah, and because, that's all they care about. And especially because uh, someone who's Malkiri, they're very obvious because there's not a lot of them left, and a lot of them kind of kept to the old ways, you know, with their appearance and their mannerisms and and the things that they say. Actually, I think only a few of them actually kept to it. Well, it's not until later that they start readopting. I would say something about that. But it would be a spoiler beyond well, the end of the book, so I'm not going to do that. But in any case, Fayu yeah, has got this that right. Fayu has got this background in her, this upbringing in her. So, so yeah, when when Perrin says no, you're not fighting, she's like, you're kidding, right? Like you know where I'm from, she's like, right? I'll fight you. <laughs> she's like, you know, no, no, really. She's like, I'll fight you first and teach you a lesson, and then let me at those trollocs because I'm about to 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 just go crazy on them and, and mess them up. So, you know, we, we've got this going on. And then once Perrin gets into town and kind of gets a feel for the situation, can I just say, you know, and I feel like this is obvious, but there is, there are very few places in this series, especially not in this book where the children of the light are of any good use. Nope. He's They're still, kind of jerks here. Well, and what ends up happening is when Perrin first shows up, you know, he's got this sense of, oh man, Trollocs are coming. But the town, the town's like, what do you mean Trollocs? We got to deal with these white cloaks. What do you mean Trollocs? We got, we're getting Trollocs too. That's we got enough to deal with with these stupid white cloaks. And then here come the white cloaks saying, "You're all dark friends." When all that, yeah, BS. Uh, did, I believe Perrin had to rescue uh, Mistress Luhan and. Uh, and Matt's sisters from the White Cloaks. Right. And and that's what I'm saying is like the White Cloaks were there doing things they shouldn't have been doing. I, and my thing is I never liked these guys, not because or just because of their overzealousness. You could almost call it religious zealousness, even though it's not really religion. But, you know, it's 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 got that air about it, like this inquisitorial air about them and then which they have their own version of the an inquisition called the questioners but the the bottom line of it is you know they they show up unannounced and basically say we have authority to do whatever we want and this whole time i'm reading about this group of people i'm sitting here reading like i'm like in two rivers i'm sitting here reading this and i'm going where did these guys ever get off like who yeah. who's letting them just run through their lands? I mean, and and some Not of them don't. Uh, there's a big. So our our notes actually doesn't talk much about what happens. Totally, uh, parents, parents, and family are killed. And he finds that out pretty quick. I, actually, I think I, I, help me remember. I want to say he did. He, he discovered it. Because he went to his farm. Like, before he even got into town, he was like, I've got to go. Because he went and checked on the Althor farm, and then he went and checked on his farm. And yeah, I it was all messed up. Only, I, I think that the only reason that he checked on Rand's farm first is because... Uh, well, I think they ran it into closest. it first. Yeah, it was on the way. Right. But he still... Um, he discovers that his... I think the majority of his family has gone. His parents, for sure. And I want to say there were several other members of his family that were dead or apparently dead. I'll put it to you that way. Um, so yeah. when he shows up, it's just the Two Rivers is in all kinds of 
just mess. I was going to say turmoil, but a lot of the people who were still in actually in Emmons Field, they were still kind of okay. But those in the outlying areas, like Perrin's family and the Althor farm and all of that, they were all, you know, messed up from one thing or another, from, you know, Trolloc raids, from Children of the Light, White Cloaks coming in and doing their ridiculous thing. Yeah. You know, and actually, uh, Perrin starts gathering people uh, as he makes his way to Emmons Field because he knows that the Trollocs are coming and that he needs to... Perrin is a protector. Perrin is straight up a protector. He right. cannot just leave people to their own, no matter how hard he tries and no matter how hard he insists that he's not a leader. Perrin is a great leader. He... He he is a protector and he's a leader and he cannot help himself. And, you know, I'm wondering if because and I'm not going to get into any, a, a whole lot of details about this one, because it's another series and two, because of what's going on right now. But I'm wondering if George Martin took any cues from Perrin Ibarra when he wrote Jon Snow, because there's a lot of similarities between those two characters, especially, you know, John being thrust into leadership positions and he never really wanted that. I mean, his whole shtick in the beginning was I'm not meant to be a Lord or a leader. I'm going this way. And he went that way and ends yep. up becoming a leader. And he's like, I really didn't want this. Perrin's kind of the same thing. He's like, I don't want any of this. And everyone was like, well, no, you're, you're the, you're the leader now. I mean, you're, you're the guy, you're the man with the plan. We're going to get behind you. We're going to follow you. Yeah. So, you know, so coming back into town and, and figuring everything out, you know, and I don't even like he blames a lot of it on being Tiberian, but really, if you think about it, you've got Perrin who's slow of thought. He doesn't rush into things mm -hmm. and he always figures out the right thing to do. Right. Like, why wouldn't you follow him? Well, and that's a good point. And, and that's, and that's something that I often, remarked upon whenever I was reading the books, especially this book, because like I said in the last episode, a lot of things pivot and hinge on this book. You know, there's a lot of information that happened, you know, that we run into, especially with the arc and the weight I always and then in this particular plot line, we see some serious char character development from most, if not all, the characters involved, uh, except maybe the yeah. white folks. But you know, we, we see this um so, These people rising up to defend defend their town, not just from White Cloaks, but from Trollocs. You see Perrin. And you have to, um, sorry, I missed this part. Uh, Tam and Abel Cawthon are being chased by the White Cloaks as well. It seems like the White Cloaks are just gathering up people who are close to Three Taviran. So Tam Althor, Rand's adoptive father, of course, and then Abel Cawthon and... Uh, Matt's two sisters. Matt's two sisters are actually captured. Tam and Abel actually escape into the woods. And they're hidden by Varen and Alana. Yes. Because it's Varen and Alana. They show up and they say, hey, Perrin, you know, Perrin's people come with us. We need to show you something. And then that something is Tam Althor and Abel Cawthon. Um, now, <clears throat> the thing that I kind of clued in on in all of that, too, is the fact that, you know, you know, Perrin gets into town and he sees all these things happening. And the thing about it is, is Perrin, you, know, you, you remarked on his slow of thought, which is not to be misconstrued as dumb, but misconstrued as thoughtful, as articulate, yes. as, I want to say patient. brooding, but pa oh, yeah, <laughs> he's pretty patient. <laughs> I think his Taviran nature enhances that. But see, that's that's what's interesting to me is I think being Taviran is not – it, it, I don't think it transforms necessarily who you are. I think it enhances the things that you need to be, if that makes any sense. And because, yes. because if you think about it, if you look at the progression of these characters throughout the whole series, when you get to the very end – you know, with everything going on in A Memory of Light, and no, there's not going to be any spoilers for this, but I'm just remarking, if you read the characters then, yeah, they've they've changed. They've been through stuff. I mean, they've been through 
14 books. You know, they've, there's been some development. There's been some change. There's so much change. But if you really get down to it, there are still moments in that book where you go, ain't that just a Rand thing to do? Of course, Perrin would do that. Of course, Matt would say that and think that. And, and uh, <laughs> Especially old dice Matt. Again, you know, I mean, and you know, because you still find yourself saying that is such a, you know, insert name here thing to do is to is to act in this way and like i said a memory of light and especially well the last two books especially to uh, towers of midnight and a memory of light they definitely i definitely recalled a lot of stuff that happened in this book that's why i think this book is my favorite because so much happens in it but the the point i guess i'm making with all this is perrin begins that growth into who he needs to become and you know and he says well i'm not a leader and i'm not this i'm not that and the thing is He's growing into it because he, on the one hand, he says, no, I'm not a leader. I don't want to be a lord. I don't want to have power. I just want to live a simple life. But then he turns around and sees people being oppressed, his people being oppressed, and he says, whoa, no, that's going to stop. So it, it, it's this thing of he is the right kind of leader. He is not a man after power, but he is a man of the people. He sees his people, yes. and he says, no, you're not going to do this to my people. He develops that kind of kinship with his wolf brothers. You know, him being a wolf friend, you know, that's that's his thing is you don't mess with the wolves and you don't mess with people from the two rivers. You just you don't do it. And don't mess Perrin, with my don't mess with my Taviran and don't touch Fayil. Do not touch Fayil. Do not touch Fayil. <laughs> uh I think that another uh thing with wolves and parent is that parent is very much about his connections. He loves his friends, he loves his family, he loves his even master Luhan, you could say would be like a father to him because he's not a loner. He so close to their family. Perrin is not a loner. No, he is, lone he needs a pack and he, he needs a pack kind of gets two of them. <laughs> um, yeah, a, <laughs> an actual wolf pack. And of course his, his, um, his compatriots, his friends and family. Um, so, but talking about this leadership role that Perrin moves into you know, Perrin, you know, gets in there and says, you know, we've got to we've got to defend against the Trollocs. You know, these white cloaks are just a nuisance. We need to worry about the real danger. And as he gets in there and gets everyone rallied and gets everyone working, I mean, actually working to building defenses and and getting things ready, people start calling him Lord Perrin or Perrin Golden Eyes. Perrin Golden Eyes. You know, and but they but they some I think a couple of times they actually called him Lord Golden Eyes as a, as kind of a just kind of like a nickname. They don't they didn't really address him in person as that, but you know, things get around and he gets yeah. the title and he's like, Where did this no, I don't want to be a lord? That's when he starts pushing back, like, stop calling me Lord Perrin. But everyone's looking at him, even even the mayor, even even Bran Alvere is looking at him and saying, well, I'm following your lead. And he's like, well, no, you're the mayor. He's like, even yeah, you're Lord Baron. Even Tam and Abel, who are two of the best at everything. Oh, yeah. They're amazing at many things. I mean, Tam is a sword master and, uh, I mean, blade master. I know I said that wrong. Don't at me. Uh, <laughs> it's the one I'm going to add. He... He has fought in wars. He is a leader. And right. then you've got Abel Cawthon, who is a horse trader. He's very charismatic. He's very similar to Matt. Like, With the exception him. of Matt, is, he was kind of on the sleazy side sometimes, I think, the, the devious side. But e even at one point in the book, they said that Matt did something that was absolutely like goofy and very mischievous and Abel was like, that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's the, but that's the thing though, is when you you know, talking about these leaders, these, these tried and tested leaders, you know, the, the mayor of Emmons field and these, uh, a, a battle hardened blade master, you know, a veteran of the IU war, which was no, that was no small conflict. You know, if you've read New Spring, you get it. Um, but the, you know, I think that one of the one of the better parts of the book, if I'm remembering it correctly, is there was a moment where you know Perrin's been bucking this leadership responsibility, and then they're they're about to fight, like they're about to have the battle of the two rivers against these Trollocs, which, in my opinion, is one of the best 
fights, best battles in the entire series. Just just the way it was done and the way the people rose up was so great. I need to comment on that more in a second. But what I'm getting to is as this stuff is headed that way and Perrin is trying to insist, you know, I'm not a lord, I'm not a lord. Perrin is still looking at Tam Althor and and Bran Alvere. He's like, what do you guys want to do? Like, you guys are the leaders. And there's a moment where Tam looks at him and he says, no, Perrin, you're the leader. This is your time. This is it's time for you to stand up, and you have stood up. He's like, but I'm not, I'm not a leader. He's like, well, well, you're not acting like a follower, son. You know, I'm not quoting him correctly, but that was basically the yeah. the entire conversation was Tam saying, "Open your eyes, realize what you're doing." Oh, I cannot it, believe, I cannot believe that the notes don't mention this, but this is also the part where Perrin uh, convinces the Tinkers to come into town and Aram picks up a sword. Oh, man. Dude, that whole... Look, <laughs> let's... Okay, we're going to have to talk about this. So that yes. whole thread within this plot line absolutely wrecked me. Because yes. here you have these peaceful Tinkers... That Perrin invited in for protection because he didn't want them out there among the white cloaks who could do anything to you at any given time. You can never trust them, but definitely the Trollocs. So he invited them into Emmons Field for protection, and he knew they weren't going to fight. He knew they could help. You know, they could help build. They could help you know, aid the wounded because Tinkers are very good at all of that. They won't fight, but they will aid. So he was like, well, let's bring them in here. Well, then... I believe, Thorne, help me remember, I believe what how this started was Aram begins to talk to Perrin, and of course they're having that philosophical discussion of, you know... There's also, um, before before the Tinkers came into Emmonsfield, uh, the Tinkers were attacked, and That's both right. of Aram's parents are dead. And, okay... I'm drawing lines here. Uh, okay, so you got this tinker whose family was killed and he wants to seek revenge. You've also got from Rand's memories, the, the memories of the Aiel, the first uh, Aiel maiden of the spear who was unwilling to let her daughters be taken and she refused to follow the way of the leaf. So you've got parallels right there right and and i did think about that last week and i think i may have tried to mention it but i was like well you know we're going to talk about that when we get to the two rivers because there is an obvious parallel there and, and that's and that's you know I, I may have brought this out last week too but the this book is the most comprehensive look at the aiel and the tinkers that you get especially because they yes. have a shared history and what yes. ends up happening in this moment is you know Aram's hurting. He wants to do something about what's happened to his parents. Of course, you've got um, Rain and his wife who are trying to guide him. Uh, they're his grandparents. His grandparents. And they're trying to guide him and say, well, no, we know it hurts, but you must follow the way of the leaf. If you follow the way of the sword, it's going to be bad for you. You know, it, that that way lies bloodshed and death and violence. And then Perrin hears all this, and Perrin, just being Perrin, and let's just be real. He was just being parent. He basically looks at Aram and says, look, you can either live scared the rest of your life or you can pick up a sword and defend yourself and defend those that you love. And that's what I chose to do. And Aram decides that Perrin's logic beats out anything he's ever been taught. And he, if I remember correctly, they had a bunch of weapons inside the wine spring in, which is where they're having this conversation. And Aram stands up and he crosses the room and he grabs a sword. And in that moment, his grandmother, you know, right after that shows up, sees that and she loses it. Like she, yeah. and when she lost it, I'm like, Oh, this isn't good. Like, I'm like, Oh my God. Cause no, up to this point, it's the very been, sad. Right. The tinkers have been, you know, very happy, very, I won't say go lucky, but you know, they've been very peaceful people, even when they've been, attacked and harangued and mistreated they are definitely you know definitely the ones that are like well you know what we'll get through this they're just possessions it's just people you know it's just my body it'll heal everything will be fine you know 
you see these people who are so non-confrontational, and then they see one of their own, especially one of their own kin, the grandson, holding a sword, and they believe so strongly against that that she she flips out and she she does everything but grab the sword to take it from Aaron because she's that afraid of it. And she is just yeah. pleading, don't do this. And that's that whenever Perrin, Perrin says that everybody has a right to to defend themselves or to make their own decision on it. So in foreshadowing for later books, for those who have not read the later books but have read this one, this comes back around in a way that is quite ironic. But anyway, so um, that's enough foreshadowing for now. So... <clears throat> All of that happens within the context of preparing to fight these Trollocs. And before they really get going and they really get into to where they, they ultimately triumph over these Trollocs that are trying to overrun, um, you know, overrun. They, the they were actually thinking that they were going to lose. Oh, yeah. No, they absolutely did. But before they, they got to the point where they did not lose, because, you know, we warned you guys about spoilers. <laughs> so before they got to that point... Perrin does something a little, I wouldn't say crazy, but... A little brash. He, he, he very much channels the soldiers going into World War II, and that is he marries Fael. And when he did that, I was like, Perrin, now you're going to die. Dang, gum it, man. You're going to die now because you're married. <laughs> Fael wanted to get married, and so did Perrin. And I, I think it was more Fael's idea. Well, because she didn't want absolutely no one. Yeah. Because she, I know that usually in Emmons Field, after a betrothal, they wait a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. But Fael convinced them to marry them immediately. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the exact custom. I'd have to pull it up, but you're but you're right. There was a there's a time where like the engagement is declared and then there's a a certain I think it's like period. six months or something. Yeah, it was something weird like that. And then um, they were just like, hey, you know what? We may not have six months. I want to marry Perrin. So let me marry Perrin. And they were like, eh, he's the Lord. Okay, we'll do it. So, and yeah. So, but then yeah. when they when they get married, right after they get married and they celebrate and whatnot and, and, and so forth, they... Perrin does exactly what we were speaking about earlier, and he tries one more thing to get Fayil away from the fight. <laughs> and he asks her to go to Camelin to ask Queen This Mugay is my to favorite. To fight. It's my favorite Fayil moment. Okay, she, she is when she, she comes back. <laughs> oh yeah, when she she well she comes back so smug. And she comes back so cool, too, though. Well, and she comes back so fast because he was like, okay, it's going to take her forever to go get those soldiers and come back. Like, Perrin never he, counted he on so those He was so sure they were all going to die. Yeah, he, and he, he never counted on those soldiers coming up. And then they show up and, and basically save the day. Because it wasn't so they were soldiers. It was, it was people from Devon Ride and all the other outlying villages. Yep. Fael went up there and rallied them to fight the Trollocs. And right as they thought that they were about to die, here comes Devon Ride and like people shouting these war cries that are of the surrounding villages. And Fael's there, and it's just enough to beat back the Trollocs. And really, <laughs> really, if 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 Robert Jordan had wrote what I'm about to say in the book, I would not have found it out of character. For either the time period, you know, like actual writing in the '90s, or or anything, but basically, when Fayil comes back, she was like, "You thought you could play me, but I've played the player," you know, because, <laughs> because that's basically what happened. She's like, "I know what he's doing. I'm not going all the way, Camelin, because he knows he's not an idiot. He's just trying to get rid of me. I'm gonna do one better. I'm gonna rally the rest of the two rivers. I'm gonna rally Devon Ride and Watch Hill." And, and these other outlying areas and go to these farms and get people to come to Emmons Field and fight for the, all their lands. Because if, if, if Emmons Field falls, everything else is going to fall. So she she has this, you know, inborn ability to be a leader, being the daughter of one of the great captains, you know, the the Marshal General of Saldea, 
she goes out there and she she rallies troops. She rallies people and she shows back up and she just kind of looks at Perrin and was just like, yeah, I did that. You underestimated me. I'm also your wife. So. <laughs> and he is not mad at all. Oh he is God. just at this point, he was thinking that he's never going to see Fael again. And he's just sitting there wishing that he could see her face mm-hmm. one last time before he dies and then here she comes to save the day like a badass <laughs> <laughs> and everyone just rides in and she's like she's up if i remember right she's like up on this hill and they come over the hill and they're all riding down to to help and she's just she's still up there and it's almost like she's just got her arms crossed and a little smirk on her face like yeah this is what I did. And I just saved the day. All Perrin can do is he is just drawn to her. He just has to get to her at this point. Because at this point, she is the most beautiful woman in the world. Oh, yeah. Like, for sure. she is such a badass. She is strong. She is intelligent. She is she's all, just She's the whole beautiful. package. She's the package deal, man. I mean, if there was, yes. if there was any lingering doubts, which they're – there, there were, but there weren't about Perrin, Mary, and Fayil. When she showed up with those soldiers, he was just like, "No, nah, I made the right choice. I may not feel like I need and to I know be here, but I made the right choice with this woman." People might be mad because I am a Fayil fangirl. I love her. Well, I just and don't you see can why people I'm super don't like excited her. About this well, I just don't see why people don't like her, and maybe it has to do with things that happen later, and I can maybe see that. But as of the Shadow Rising. I don't see any reason to dislike Fayil. Sure, yeah, there's that whole back and forth where she's mad at Perrin, then not mad at Perrin, then mad at Perrin, and all this other stuff. But let's just be real here for a second. You know, a lot of that had to do with the culture that she came from, and that is stated, you know, stated that the Saldeans have a completely different way of looking at things. So, you know, and I also thought it made an interesting dynamic for Perrin because Perrin is this kind of chill, he's, 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 you know, solid. He's 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 immovable, but he's kind of serene. He was out of the three Tavirian, he was the le- actually the least violent, uh, if you think about it. You know, as far as in the personality and his tendencies, he was the least violent, and you know, in in those terms. But then he has all this stuff thrust on him. He doesn't know what to do with it, and then he marries a Saldean who is a she. She knows how to fight. Did She's fire? been trained how to fight, and he's just <laughs> like, "What did I? What did I do? Yes, yeah, fire and ice. Like what?" What did I? Oh, okay, all right. Okay, Fayol's mad. Okay, I can smell she's angry. Oh, 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 like I, I what did this happen? Problem, though, <laughs> is that Perrin relies on his nose instead of asking her straight out, like, how do you feel? Because I feel like Saldans, they're very open people. Oh, they want to fight when they're mad. They're mad. They, they when they're happy, they're happy. Yeah, they're they're like if we're if we're gonna. We're not going to give each other the silent treatment. We're going to fight about it. And because once you fight about it, it's all out in the open. The communication's mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And I kind of agree with that. I would rather fight yeah. than, mm-hmm. than just, just keep it Get, get it out there. Get it over with. And that's the thing is parents very much, if I can, for the longest time anyway, if I can avoid violence and argument and confrontation, I will. Whereas Fayil is very much, I'm pissed at you. You need to ask me why so we can fight about it. And I don't think it's in the shadow rising, but there is one part in the books where she actually looks at him. It might be fires of heaven. She actually looks at him and she says, husband, we haven't had a proper fight in a while. And when she said that, I was like, dang, like, (laughs) man. Sometimes sometimes you need to fight and sometimes you need to air your grievances. I'm not saying like a knockout, drag out fist fight, but Sometimes yelling helps. Well, you know, honestly, and, and and I think too. Why is that in my pocket? Um, I think too. Um, <laughs> in my pocket. At context, I found a. Uh, it's basically a USB adapter in my pocket. I guess I put it in there after I moved my setup back in here. But anyway, the um <clears throat> the, but that's the thing is I feel like the Saldanes especially. You know, they prize strength. And I mean, because, you know, when you meet some other Saldeans, and I'm not going to ruin that part, but, you know, you, you see that they kind of have, I mean, you know, same mindset as Fayu was, hey, let's fight about it and let's let's put each other in each other's places, you know, whereas Perrin, 
he doesn't want to do that. He's very much the handle with care. You know, Fayul is fragile, and Fayul is like, no, like Fayul let's not- let's let's put some boxing gloves on and get out in the yard and fight it out, and then we'll you know be husband and wife again after we get over that, you know, and get it all out Fayul there and fight it. Furthest thing from fragile, she is. Like, that's why I like Fael. She is strong. Mm-hmm. She's independent. She doesn't need Perrin. She just wants him. She loves Perrin, like, with all her heart. She doesn't She doesn't need him to right. be there for her. Absolutely. She can handle things on her own. Like, we find out later, she can handle stuff on her own. Oh, she no, will look, get it figured look, out. Look, y'all, uh, no spoilers, but later on, y'all, Fael can handle business, okay? I'm just, I'm just saying, later on in the series... She scared me. <laughs> she terrifies me yeah. later in the series. She, she is not a weak woman. She is so strong. And I really appreciate her as a character. Oh, absolutely. And as a person, honestly. I think that if I knew Fael in real life, I would get along great with her. Because I love people who will just tell you how it is. Fael, I love Blunt. Fael is the type of person that you want in your corner and you don't want to cross. Period. Yes. That is the way she is. Now, one last thing about the Two Rivers arc, and I know we got two other arcs to cover, but if I'm honest, the two big arcs are the Two Rivers arc and the IO Waste arc. So these other two we'll kind of get through fairly quickly. Not because we're trying to glance over it, because it's just not as much to go over. Um, but the, another important thing that happens within the context of the Two Rivers events is the fact that the Children of the Light have been trying this whole time to arrest parents. This whole time. And Perrin makes a bargain. He says, and, you know, Thorne helped me remember this right. He tells them, he says, if you aid us in this fight, then when the battle is over and I survive, you can take me away. But the thing is, the children showed up to the fight and they just sat there. They didn't fight. Yeah, they, they didn't draw their to- swords. And you want to talk about mad? I was furious at those guys. Not that, it, not that I needed much reason to be, but they just showed up and they let these people fight and die when literal Trollocs, literal dark monsters are killing people around them and they're just sitting yeah, How can you say that you're from the light whenever you're not even willing to defend people from Trollocs? That's, that's, that, was my whole, that was my whole thing. In, in this part because because it was it was freaking Dane Bornhold and he was vindictive right he was being vindictive because he believed that Perrin you know um, killed his dad when which we all know Perrin yeah. didn't do but he was so vindictive and revengeful about it that he just said even the freaking tinkers though had children strapped to their backs like they weren't going to fight but they had children strapped to their oh, they were backs ready to run and get and out of there and and and, and, and they were going them. to do what they could mm-hmm. to get the children away too like they didn't have to they could obviously run faster without children on right, their backs absolutely but they weren't going to leave these children to the trollocs either the tinkers are freaking brave oh for sure and and I've, i never thought that their non-violent ways were made them stupid or cowardly it just made them have to adapt to not being able to do those things I, now as a as a person i disagree with the tinker philosophy but as a group of people in this setting i i like the tinkers and i never thought they were i didn't look at them the way maybe the aiel look at them or even a lot of people throughout the different countries look at them because some of them look at them as thieves and and things like that and mistrust them but but the entire impression i got of the tinkers you know, I, I liked them. And so that that's actually why the scene we talked about earlier with, with Aram and his grandparents, that's why it caught me so hard is because these people were – all of their emotions were pleasant emotions or they were subdued emotions. They weren't these – this crazy, you know, grandmother having to tr- – she, she's trying to literally save her – we're back on this – trying to literally save her, her, son, her <laughs> grandson. But the thing is you see that and then you connect that – I always tie things back in. You tie that in. You, you you look at how they were ready to, yeah, strap children. People, they don't know these people. They don't know these people from Emmonsfield. They have no reason to help exactly. these people from Emmonsfield. But they show up and they say, hey, my back ain't got nothing on it. If the Trollocs break the lines and the town's in danger, I will take your kid, strap him to my back, and I will 
haul behind away from them, and I will I will save your kid. Like, come on, like. If you don't like the Tinkers after that, you just need to get on somewhere because I, after I saw that, I was like, Tinkers, yo, MVP of Battle Two Rivers. Much respect for that. So much respect. Yes, exactly. I agree. And that's, but that's the thing. That's what made me so mad at the Children of the Light is they're sitting there with weapons, with horses, with resources. If they had started the fight, Fayil would have never had to have went anywhere because they had enough people. But the thing was, I think Perrin. I think when Perrin sent Fayul the way, he had he he had some multiple reasons for doing so. The chief among them being, I'm trying to save my wife and, and get her out of danger and all of that. But also, I think there was a small part of that said, "Please get back here with something. Maybe we can last long enough for her to get back with some reinforcements." Because again, even though he didn't count on those reinforces reinforcements. He still counted on them way more than he ever counted on the children of the light because he knew those sons of guns were not going to come help him. I mean, they knew it. And then to kind of wrap all this up, after the battle's over, people are cleaning up, mourning the dead, but but kind of in a good mood because they just beat a bunch of Trollocs back and saved their lands. Bornhold comes up and says, all right, it's time to go. And Perrin looks at him and he says, no, man. You didn't. You didn't respect the bargain. I'm not going anywhere with you. You didn't fight. Yeah. Not a single one of your men fought for us with us. And the bargain was, if you helped us, I would go with you. So I'm not going with you. And basically, the whole town is like surrounding him. Like, I dare you. I dare. You. We just beat a bunch of trollocs. We still got the bloodlust going. We dare you to touch them. And they don't. They they basically like this. Oh, we'll got- meet again, Per and Abara, and and they take off. Yeah. And then you got everybody from Devon Ride and Watch Hill too, because the tri- the children aren't locals. Oh, no, they're, they're not, not somebody who grew up around there. I, I learned this: you never underestimate the power of you know people depending on one another in a local setting. You know you, the okay. whole outsider thing. Like you never never discount that. You know, and, and again, just drawing parallels between this and Game of Thrones, not because there's like obvious parallels but just i you know i watched the new episode the other night so it's kind of where my head's been um is you know you go to in in a game of thrones it's that's the north you know if you're not a northerner you're an outsider and you're immediately not trusted you got to really get in there and earn trust and that's not a spoiler for the new season that's that's from episode one you know that's that's how the northerners the, the northerners are the northmen are is you're not a Stark or a Car Stark, or you're not from Winterfell or any of these places. Then we don't know you. We don't trust you. Come, come, convince us to trust you. Two Rivers is the same exact way. It's hey, you're not from Devon Ride. You're not from Watch Hill. You're not from Emmonsfield. You're not from any of the outlying areas. I don't know you, friend. Give me a reason to trust you. And but they will, they will give you the opportunity to earn their trust. But you're going to earn it. And in this case. And it's not that they needed a reason to hate the White Cloaks more, but from that day on, White Cloak was basically a curse word in the two rivers. Yeah. Uh, Let's go ahead and uh, get into uh, Tanchico. Uh, And the crew headed over to Tanchico. So um, over in Tanchico, which is in Tarabon, uh, Elaine and Nynaeve, they encounter... um, Okay, so... Let's go ahead and figure this out before we keep going. Do we want to say Mogadin or Mogadian? I have literally heard Kate and Michael say both throughout the series. So which one do you want to go with? I've always said Mogadin. Okay, Mogadin it is. So don't add us. So they encounter Mogadin and the Black Aja, who they were there to find and hunt. More specifically, the Black Aja, but of course they encountered a Forsaken there. So that was uh, a plus or minus, depending on how you look at it, I guess. Um, but they, this is also where they discover the male Adom. Right. And that's, they, the black Aja has this male Adom presumably to put on Rand and they find it. I actually think that, uh, sorry, I think that might be wrong. I think that it was just one of the things that were in the, uh, palace and because they had a lot of just random Angriol and Tur Angriol in that palace. And I think what happened was Nynaeve saw it and she was like, this is evil. This is bad. I'm taking it. 
What a very naive thing to do. I love naive. And, and naive is one of those characters that I reading, like reading people discussing the books and listening to people like us discuss the books. A lot of people did not like Nynaeve starting out, but probably between this book and the next two or three books, Nynaeve really grew on a lot of people. Um, yes. I saw Nynaeve for who she was in Eye of the World. You know, I, I saw Maybe. that she was a, a young leader in a town that um, has these traditions, and she was basically just trying to prove that she was – well, that she was that she was able to do the job that she had been put, you know, in you know, been selected to do the wisdom of yeah. Emmons Field, and she was she very treated much, like a child. Oh well, yeah, and that that was where I was going was you know the 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 elders, the older people, you know the 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 women's circle and the village council, you know, they were all like, hey, you know, she's the wisdom, but whatever, she's a kid, and she's like, no, I'm going to show all of you, I'm not some kid. There's a reason why I'm young and wisdom. There's a reason why. So she had to pretty much fight for every step she gained in Emmons Field. And, I'll and then like fight for every step she gained throughout the series, but there's some slight spoilers in that. But but yes, that's Nynaeve's personality is she's going to fight for everything that she's supposed to have and going to have. I mean, if she sees something she wants, she's going to fight for it. Ask Lan, um, you know, <laughs> the, uh, ask Lan or, you know, the rest of the characters in the books to Rand, Matt. I mean, come on, Let, let's just be real here. OK, I was I was somewhat I want to say shocked, but I was a bit put off guard whenever she's an eye of the world. And, you know, I figured she'd come back around in some way. I didn't think she would literally leave her post to go find these people several towns away and and in such a way that a freaking Malkiri says, I didn't even hear you. How did you find us? Like I, I, I'm a tracker and I've been doing things to keep our our Plus yeah. being a warder, so his senses are probably heightened. Right. So he never sensed her and he did all these things to make sure that nobody, unless they were just highly trained, could find and track them. And Nynaeve just shows up and says, Hey, I'm here to take the, everybody home and they're like where did you even come from? Because she and got it in her head. like Lan, whenever she showed up like that, was just like in my head. She that that was instant turn on. He was just like, "You tracked me? What? Yes, <laughs> like, you, you tracked me, and I couldn't hear you, huh?" And that that, that was rain. a total turn You're on. Free to go. <laughs> <laughs> Marine, I no longer. I need my bond. I, 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 I need. I need it, Marine. No, don't ask questions. I, okay. I need it. So <laughs> let's get back on track. So, <laughs> our, so, our very distraction. Hey, look, people listen for that. Okay, uh, we're creating content. So, so sure. they. Uh, but we're, we're going back. Folks. Right. So, <laughs> Elaine and Naive, they are trying to. They're obtaining this male Adam. They've they've run into these, the Forsaken and the Black Aja, but they also meet a couple of characters that well one has been reoccurring since book one the other one becomes reoccurring with him throughout the rest of the series and that's bale doman we first saw in eye of the world more eye of the world references and the sean chan woman again which we also met we met her in the great hunt yes so through this they kind of in a way they befriend We've got in quotation marks here in the notes, so I'm kind of trying to put quotation mo- quotation marks in my speech here. They befriend. I don't know if that's working. The Panarch Amathera. The cast is there. <laughs> they befriend the Panarch Amathera because they rescued her from. Um, how do you how do you pronounce this one? I would say to male. To male. Okay. And they collect one of the seals on the Dark One's prison. There's a lot of stuff going on in Tanchico, okay? It's already a busy city, and then the girls get there, and it's just like, whoa, there's so much that they're having to keep up with and do. Um, oh, and badass naive moment. Oh, well, well, duh. Fighting one of the Forsaken, standing toe-to-toe with one of the Forsaken, and not exactly losing. Not exactly losing. Actually, she kind of won. She did win because freaking Mogadine was like, I'm done. 
I've had enough. I can't, I can't fight this chick. And of course, all throughout the books later, oh, whenever they bring that up, you know, whenever the other forsaken bring that up against her, she's just like, look, she had to drop on me. Okay. Like you guys, you know, she's trying to like make it sound better when really she just didn't want to own up to a, to a butt kicking basically. But Nynaeve handed it to her. She really did. And that was actually, that whole sequence was fantastic. Just Nynaeve's like, Hey, you know what? E- I'm going to beat the crap out of you and here's how I'm going to do it. And it's just like, here's all these weaves I shouldn't know how to do, but Oh look, I'm a freaking genius. Here it is. And Nynaeve is definitely a genius. Oh, for sure. And she is, well, for all her personality, she's also very good at being angry. (laughs) Right. And that was, and and this is still, we're still seeing a Nynaeve that has to get angry in order to channel like that. She has not broken through that yet. So she's she's just she's pissed when she's fighting Mogadine, and at this point, the the matter she is, the the more powerful she is, really, and she really gets into her anger when she's going after Mogadine, and she just thrashes her, and it was it was yeah. such a that was such a fun encounter. It was such a fun fight to read. Um, so uh, Nynaeve ends up shielding Mogadine, and then. Um but they're discovered by one of the black Aja and that's whenever Mogadine escapes because dum dum from the black Aja has a Turong reel that makes Balefire that she has no way of controlling. Oh, Balefire. That word exhausted me by the end of the series. Uh, <laughs> such a, such a, um, I really don't know what I want to say about Bellfire other than other than Bellfire bad. Bellfire bad. Bellfire bad. Bellfire bad and Bellfire terrible when you don't know what you're doing with it, which is exactly what was happening here. So so a lot of good well, things it's, it's partially not knowing what she was doing. It also partially it wasn't a weave. She couldn't control it. Right. So it's like it's like shooting a gun but not knowing how to hold it you've got recoil Mm -hmm. oh yeah and and (laughs) i'm sorry but i would not want to be on the recoil end of bale fire that just does not sound like a fun time i mean there's no trip to disney world it's 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 oh i'm about to kill you oh god what did i do oh oh pain oh oh no i've i I done messed up now i mean that's, that's exactly what happened but that's pretty much almost any character that uses Bellfire in the whole of the series. It's like, oh, I did that. Oh, I did that. Oh. Yeah. Whoops. Especially Brand. But, (laughs) (laughs) anyway, so, um, but that was kind of the main thing that happened in Tanchico. I mean, we could really get into a lot of the other stuff, but really it's just a lot of interactions and just kind of, you know, Bale and Aginan kind of coming alongside and kind of aiding Elaine and Nynaeve and, and getting, you know, um, getting them to to where they need to be, basically. So, um, but the uh, the coolest thing about that, though, and you know, I hate we can't talk about it a little bit more because we had a lot to talk about with the two rivers. Is um, the most important thing is that they get this male aid. Um, and Thorn, if I remember correctly, isn't this where they hand it over? Didn't they hand it over to Agin and they tell Agin to to get rid of it in the ocean. Yeah, to throw it into the deepest part of the ocean that she could find. So that's how it's left in the Shadow Rising, is they obtain this Adom from the Black Aja, they, they being naive, fight and kick the crap out of Mogadine, and basically after this victory of sorts, they turn around to Aginan and say, hey, you guys have a boat, you guys are going out on the water, do me a favor, drop this in the water. So that's the that's how the male Adom thing is left thing mean plot how that's kind of left in um left in the shadow rising because the whole point of them going wasn't necessarily just to find the black aja but they had gotten word that there was something that could potentially you know a, a terror real or something of some kind of weapon that they could use against the dragon reborn and come to find out it's this male adam so Yes, Nynaeve definitely wanted to get rid of it, so her thought was bottom of the ocean. Nobody's going down there. Drop it down there, and we'll never have to worry about it again. So not terrible logic, 
but that is how it's left. So at, by the end of the Shadow Rising, we are we are of the opinion and of the mind that the male Adam has been gotten rid of by being tossed into the ocean. But other than all of that, Mogadine's defeated, but she's not gotten rid of. She escapes in the Balefire confusion. So she lives to fight another day. You know, it's not like whenever Randy yeah. Callender's Forsaken in the first, you know, four books, and he basically just about every Forsaken he meets, he kills. Um, so he, um, yeah, you know, it, it's not like that. Mogadine lives to fight again, but she's licking her wounds, and she's very much living up to her name as the Spider, and she's going in hiding and staying out of the, staying off the radar and staying out of the way, especially in this defeat um, by Nynaeve. And then the last, so moving right through it, the last thread we need to address, and really there's not a ton to talk about with this one because it mostly sets things up for later in the series, is uh, there's some stuff going on at the White Tower that Thorne's going to start telling us about right now. <laughs> okay, so uh, Min gets to the White Tower and to report to the Am- Amarlin. Mm-hmm. Um, Min ends up staying at the tower in the guise of Elmindrida, which is actually Min's real name. But nobody knows it. It's her full name. She hates it. Uh, I I believe that Elmindrida has a meaning. Um, if it does, I don't remember it. Guys, I'm so bad at stuff. <laughs> I'm looking it up right now. This is why we don't have more followers, because we don't know things. <laughs> We're coming for we you, White Tower. <laughs> those girls. They kick our butts. Uh, they have a brown on their side. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that's losing fight. We're no, no, no. But um, while you're while you're discovering that, so she takes on this guise of um, Elmendretta, which is actually her real name, but nobody knows it. Everybody just has always been introduced to her and calls her Men. But she creates this persona around her real name this giddy, empty-headed woman who's not really able to decide between two suitors. And basically, that's kind of the, if I remember right, that's kind of the kind of the thing that, quote-unquote, brings her to the White Tower is, oh, no, I don't know what to do, so I'm here to seek the advice of the Aes Sedai, and I just, I just don't know what's going on. Um, you know, so she's there under that guise, if you will. Um, did you find anything on the uh, name there, Thorne? Not yet. I'm still searching for it. I think it has to do with being like uh, flighty and very feminine and basically the exact opposite of men. Which is exactly what she did with this persona. She basically lived up to her actual name, if that's indeed the, the, um, the meaning, which would be, you know, appropriate. But the thing about it is when Min shows up at the White Tower, actually, if I remember correctly, Min's arrival at the White Tower is how the book opens. And she, of course, I, can't remember. I, I think it, I, I'm pretty sure it is because I, I remember some I remember this stuff. and I remember thinking to myself, how are these things going to pan, pan out in the rest of the book? Um, so as everyone knows by this point, if you don't know at this point, what are you reading? Um, <laughs> men has visions, and they often appear around um, the people that she sees, either around their head or near their person or whatever. Um, and they, you know, they foretell the future, and a lot of times they absolutely do come true. And she sees a lot of violence and turmoil when she shows up at the White Tower. She sees, you know, women with, you know bloody faces and, and injuries and same for a lot of the warders, especially the warders, um, you know, just getting tore up. And then there's at one point um, she sees Suan Sanche, the Amarlin. She is lying uh, naked on the floor. So she's like, what is that about? Um, but come to find I'm out. sorry for the noise. That's being crazy. Oh, I, I wouldn't even. I can't even hear him. Which it'll probably turn up, turn out on the recording. So, hi. Anyway, so um, but what ends up happening? The the big significant thing that happens in the White Tower is the fact that Elida has enacted a plan to depose Swan Sanche, the you know rightful Armalin seat, and of course her keeper, which was uh, Liana. 
And then after this de- this deposing, I guess that's how you would say that, Elida is herself made Armalin and a lot of the Aes Sedai, especially the, the, those of the Blue Aja, basically get out of the White Tower. They're like, this isn't good for us. We're gone. So basically there's a, from this point forward, and I don't really think it's much of a spoiler to say this, but for this point forward in the series, there's pretty much a split um, in the White Tower. There's a long time before we see anything kind of develop in the way of unity in that. But this is where it starts. Um, there's a lot of, you know, the warders fighting other warders and even some Aes Sedai fighting other Aes Sedai. The tower splits and these women leave. Well, what actually happens is Swan and Liana are both stilled, which, as everyone knows, is their ability to channel the One Power is effectively removed. They're cut off from the One Power. And they have the side effect of removing their ageless appearance. So it actually makes Liana and Swan look like they did when they first began to channel, which was at a young age. So both of these women who are pretty old at this point are are a lot older than they look because of the ageless face. They now look like they did when they were girls, when they came to the tower and they first began to channel. So they look very, very young um, whenever this happens. So there's all kinds of chaos going on and um, all kinds of things happening, you know, fighting going on, Elida making some sweeping decrees and just all kinds of craziness. Um, You know, I I have to say this, Thorne, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You know, for how underhanded Elida was, I mean, she really got in there and made this happen pretty effectively, if not brutally. Yeah, but she's kind of also a bitch. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, you're not going to hear me defend her in any way, shape, or form, but at this, I, you, you have to at least look and say, hey, Swan was doing her thing, and the next thing you know, she's naked on the floor of a prison cell. Oh, hi, men's visions. How are you? So, you know, that's, you know, th- these a lot of these visions are coming to life in front of men's eyes. I would say there are some, I would probably argue that happened later, but the majority of what she saw when she showed up at the White Tower, tower was the breaking of the White Tower, was the split. So the Blue Aja yeah. gets up and flees, basically. Meanwhile, uh, Swan and Liana are stilled and imprisoned, uh, presumably awaiting execution. Well, while they're You didn't see me do this, but whenever we started talking about Elida, I put my shawl on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so... Men being men and being under the radar, again, everyone passing her off as this airheaded, indecisive girl. Um, Which, by the way, uh, she was named after a woman in a story who spent her time sighing over men. And that's why she hates her name. And that's why she acted the way she did. Got it. So we we were not far off on that that meaning. But um, men is able to actually get down to the prison to the cells and free Swan and Liana. And then all of them get up to get to they, leave. They have help from, from Gawain. What? No, uh, the mistress of the kitchens. Oh, um, oh my Lord. What was her name? She's so important. I love her so much. Yeah, but I'm trying, I'm forgetting her name because for some reason my name, my, my brain keeps going to Shiriam and it's not Shiriam. It's, um, no, it's not. Oh my God. Shh. Um, I can't remember her name. But it's, yes, it's the Mistress of Kitchens. Oh. And she's able Lars. to... Yes, yes. So she's able to help them escape, and they get in... They basically come into contact with Gawain Tricand, who helps them get out, which is interesting, because Swan and Liana's appearances don't... You know, they don't look like Swan and Liana, at least not to the... You know, not at first glance, not at first look, not unless. You oh know. no! But the the interesting part is that Gawain took uh, Elida's side. Right, that's where I was in going. the split. They he they he couldn't tell who they really were, and he was, you know, he was all about you know. I, I believe he knew. I believe, if I remember correctly, Min told him who they were, and he still let them escape. Even though he took 
a light aside on the conflict, and this is where I start hating Gawain, because Gawain cannot make a decision on whose side he's on. <laughs> That's the only thing he, make, he can't make a Like, how useless can he be? <laughs> I totally heard Cass in the background there. Yeah, he's over here by the window. <laughs> I don't know, being a dickhead. I don't know what he's doing. So, in any case, this is where Gawain... I, I love that. My cat by his voice. <laughs> I have two cats. I have two cats. <laughs> I just assumed it was him. Um, but but no. Um, so sweet. I have to. Quiet. I have to. Um, I have to agree with that. You know, and trying to remember. You know, whether he did or did not know. For some reason, I thought he didn't, but um, I could be wrong about that. But he did. in any case, he lets him escape. And Thorne, you make a very good point that um, this is where. If not the Gawain hate, then the Gawain kind of irritation and annoyance really sets in. It starts. It starts with irritation, and it slowly builds to a seething hatred. And fuck this guy. <laughs> yeah, essentially, yeah. So if you haven't read much past this book, you will. You will. You will know. Um, but in any case, while they're getting the heck out of Dodge. Um, they run into Loghain, you know, which everyone knows was the false dragon that was um, sentenced to be gentled, which is the, which is, okay, so I have to make a comment about this. Okay, so if, if you're a man, you get gentled. If you're a woman, you get stilled. But if you're in the age of legends, they called it, um, they called it something else. Thorne, do you Severing. remember? Severing, yes. Severing. And I'm just, I'm sitting here reading all these different words for the same thing, and I'm going, why can't we all just call it severing since that's exactly what it is and be done? What it is, is that stilling is a punishment. Stilling is what happens whenever a woman does something wrong. And so she needs to be punished and taken away her ability to channel for men. It's not considered a punishment necessarily. It's considering gentling. It's, it's considered it's called gentling because men who can channel are destined to go insane and die. If you cut them off from the true source, though, then they have nothing to make them go crazy. And yet, so the, I think they, the men they, would pretty much disagree with you that it's not a punishment. Yeah, a gentling is meant to be more as a, um, a precaution. Mm -hmm. And... In a way, they probably think that they are saving these men. But they're not. From killing their families and friends. Because if anyone remembers the way Loghain was in Eye of the World, because this is the last time we saw him was Eye of the World, if I remember correctly. I don't remember if he made any kind of cameo appearance in The Great Hunt, but he's in, you know, he's back in The Shadow Rising, Great Hunt or Dragon Reborn for that matter. But he's back in The Shadow Rising, you know, running into these folks and basically leaving with them. But if you, if you, even if, he made a slight appearance in the other two books. I can't quite remember if you take eye of the world, low gain that was being taken to, to be basically sentenced, if you will, or at least, you know, viewed by uh, queen Morgay's Tracan. And then you take this low gain. They're completely different people because the yes, low gain, the different. false dragon low gain was arrogant, haughty, power driven you know he was he was a, a man who could channel and was trying to be the dragon reborn he was a false dragon so he fit that bill in a way though you, i can understand why Logan would want to claim to be the dragon because if you're a man who can channel you're either a madman or you're the dragon or reborn. you're the dragon yeah so i mean so he tried to be the dragon and he get he 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 got some traction i mean he was making headlines all the way in the two rivers oh. you know i mean they were like, oh, you, hear about this, you hear about this false dragon you know they, he's he's rallied people to his cause and they say they've sent some ice to die down there and i mean just back when all the ice to die and all that stuff was still super mysterious and now by this book it's like ice to die, I'm whatever but <laughs> um but the uh i actually love Logan as a character and he becomes very important later. Right. But you don't love him at this point because you don't have enough of him. Um, 
Yes, and, and especially, I, I would love now you to feel, have adventures of war. <laughs> now you feel you feel very sorry <laughs> for him. Like, you feel very sorry for Logan in this book and, and in some other instances later on because he is a literal shell of who he used to be. He's depressed. He is well. I'll just say it. He's borderline suicidal, which is kind of the most uh, more than borderline. Well, yeah, I'm speaking specifically to this book, but the um, most people who get gentled or stilled that or or burnt out because you can also be burnt out, mm-hmm. which is also different. It, it, being burnt out is different. It's whenever you draw too much of the power and you end up burning your own connection to the tree source and I, I guess, and that can happen in multiple and i ways. guess my whole thing with the difference in i guess the definitions is i can kind of see why there's a difference between being severed and being burned out i can see why there's a fundamental difference there but i guess in my mind there's, there's a fundamental difference right there there's jordan uh the the actual they they said that there's a difference and there's a spoilery way that I can't explain why that's well. It, it stated that it's different. it'll come up later. We'll keep listening, but the um, but basically, you know, low gain was gentled, which you know I, I made the statement a few minutes ago. You know, men who can channel who are going to be gentled, they don't see it as a escape. They do see it as a punishment because you know, especially that Rand you know, can attest to in any male channeler, once you've channeled the one power, there's nothing like it. You know, it's just like, oh, I've got to, I've got to do this more, which I mean, the, the Aes Sedai, all the, you know, and women who can channel, they can, they can, you know, sympathize with that because they draw on the untainted half of the one power, but the tainted half is the whole reason why the men go crazy. And we all, of course, we all know that by this point, but, um, but in any case, they pick him up with them and, take them with them as they escape and they go and they flee the white tower as it splits. And it makes for some interesting, um, well, an interesting road trip over the course of the next book or two with a deposed Armelin and keeper, a girl that can see visions around people and a former false dragon. And that just sounds like a comedic road trip right there, right off the top, right off the bat. It does. It does. Yeah. You have, <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, but it, it it's like it, it's like men is like well no I don't have I don't have equivalents because I was gonna make Winnie the Pooh references because Logan was definitely Eeyore, but that's really all I had was Eeyore because <laughs> I, I was like poor Logan maybe maybe men would be like Tigger but then I'm like no Swan's more like Tigger so who's Pooh well no nah. I feel like I, I think you're wrong you think I'm Liana's totally Tigger in this she's totally who. Tigger. Liana's totally Tigger. And Swan would be Rabbit. She gets a little bit Swan would be Rabbit. Yeah, Swan's totally Rabbit. Because, you know, with the fish guts, tapping your foot, hands on hips, the whole nine yards. That's that's Rabbit. That's Rabbit. And Min is... Piglet. Piglet, yeah. Min is totally Piglet. Piglet. Okay, we did it. (laughs) We did it. We just related four... Um, not obscure, but four, you know, large characters in this series to Winnie the Pooh characters. My God, what time is it? Um, <laughs> it, it is almost your bedtime. It's so definitely my bedtime. So we're recording this late, you guys. Um, we had some setbacks tonight, but it's okay. So, um, but yeah, so that's kind of how the, you know, the White Tower arc kind of finishes up. You know, again, we don't see a whole lot of that. The main thrust of what we get from the White Tower happens at the you know the deposing of swan sanche and then of course it's immediate aftermath and we see all that it's a very it's a pretty catastrophic event and we could talk about all this stuff for you know two or three more episodes if we're honest but of course you know we don't want to we want to move on to some other things here in the next couple of episodes so that's what we'll, we'll cap our review of um the shadow rising so um Thorne, I'm going to do this because we haven't we haven't done this yet. Um, I kind of want to preview next week's episode, just maybe to hopefully get some people excited for it. Because Thorne and I were talking about everything today, and you know we we, we kind of like the format we've been doing of you know which Aaron and Andrew started this, and of course we are going to continue it as uh, the new hosts is the um, 
you know, we do a book review and then we, we do some episodes in between where we do different topics and things like that. Next week, I believe what we're going to do, and I, I think this is a good idea, is we're actually going to rank the books and we're going to throw New Spring in there as well. So all 15 books are going to be ranked, you know, from number 15 to number one. And but here's here's the kicker. I'm going to come up with my own list and Thorne is going to come up with her own list. And then we're both just going to launch into number 15, not having discussed whose books are in what spots. And then you guys are going to get to hear us actually go back and forth about if we think that book should or should not be in that slot. I think it's going to be a good time for everybody, especially because you guys know how, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? How many rabbit trails we tend to follow. So uh, I think, I think next week is going to be um, going to be pretty fun. So I'm definitely already working on my list. Cause I know, I know what my number one spot is, and if you've listened to this episode or the last one, you do too. But the other 14 <laughs> books, I'm going to have to sit down and think about it over the course of the next week. So um, you guys be prepared to uh, listen to Thorne and Greg potentially argue uh, <laughs> next week. So, um, But wrapping everything up tonight, uh, Thorne, how, uh, how can they follow us? How can they get in touch with us? All right. You can follow us on Twitter at Black or at tower podcast um it'll say black tower podcast and then you can also email us if you want to get mad at us or if you don't want to add us directly you can email us at black tower pod at gmail.com we also have a discord that i'll link in the description when we post this and also we have a patreon and we would like to get to the point where at least we're uh not losing money to the podcast <laughs> <laughs> and a few of the uh, the benefits for I guess you would say for joining our patreon is that we're going to be planning a once a month uh, movie night where all the patreons can come and we'll basically get on rabbit or whatever and watch a movie together Uh you will also get your own special tag in our discord server that labels you as a soldier dedicated or ashaman depending on what tier you are and also i believe we are going to be posting bloopers on the patreon <laughs> Thor we a lot do of plan on adding some things we do plan on adding more things later, but for now, that's what we got. <laughs> right. And we would love for you guys to come be uh, patrons. So hit up the Patreon uh, if you are interested in uh, becoming one of those. And, of course, to kind of come back behind what Thorne said, follow us at Tower Podcast on Twitter. Email us, blacktowerpod at gmail.com. And, of course, the links to the Discord and Patreon will be linked in the show description. But I think that's all we have for tonight. So uh, once again, for the Black Tower Podcast, I'm Greg. And I'm Thorne. And we'll catch you guys next time. Bye.